So our reading this morning is from uh, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, last week, Justin took us through uh, the beginning of chapter 2, so I'm going to continue this week by looking at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 11 and going on to verse 22. Right, so here goes. And the heading in the um, uh, New in, uh, in the RS, not the RSP, the New International Version, get it right, is um, one in Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that go in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, once, you, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the to one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his, in his flesh the law with all its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And there ends up Right, well, last week, um, I think uh, Justin uh, preached to us about the transforming power of grace. And uh, that certainly is what we see in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. Um, and I can find it. For it is by grace that you have been saved through him, and this not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So last week then, just in preaching about the transforming power of grace. Well, Paul goes on to follow um, his references to grace by showing us the way to reconciliation. And that's what I'm going to look at this morning from um, these 12 verses that take us to the end of Ephesians chapter 2. Um, the way to reconciliation. I've split this up into three points because it's always good to have a three-point sermon, isn't it? And guess what? They all begin with the same letter. So first of all, distance. Did is it come up? It's not come up. Yes. It has come up. That's right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, first of all, distance. Um, Paul talks here in, in these verses about um, the fact that we are separate from Christ and excluded from citizenship. There is a distance between man and God. 
And Paul says elsewhere that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And um, we have to bear in mind that we're all sinners. Now, sometimes, and there is this distance between us and God. Now, sometimes we can take this to extremes. Paul, I know, referred to himself as the chief of sinners. But he had a good reason for doing this, because he'd uh, led the campaign of persecution against the early church, and therefore he must have felt um, quite a, a heavy strain on his conscience because of what he'd done. Uh, but sometimes we can talk about ourselves as being the most sinful person around, you know, the real chief of sinners, and it doesn't make a great deal of sense. I remember a few years ago, I'd, uh, Marjorie must have been somewhere, I can't remember where, so I'd gone on a tram ride, as I sometimes do, to Altringham uh, to have a look in the charity shops, and uh, I was in Oxford. Uh, which is good Oxfam in Altrigan, I can tell you. I was in Oxfam, and I must have been near to the door, and it must have been in the summer because the door was open. And I could hear this conversation going on outside, and, and it was someone witnessing to someone else. And this particular person was saying, and I really was a very, very, very sinful person. I was the most sinful person there could have been. And I listened. Uh, I, I, a bit of a clue was the fact that this person was talking in an American accent. Um, so I, I moved a bit nearer to have a look at uh, this arrogant of unvirtue. And he must have been, he must have been 17. Uh, couldn't have been much more than that. And um, unlike anybody else in the streets, he was dressed in a suit with a, a brilliant white shirt and, of course, a tie, even though it's something like June. Um, and, uh, you know, he looked as if it had all gone through the washing machine uh, only that day. In fact, he looked as if he might have gone through the washing machine. <laughs> uh, and, and I thought, that there's no reality here. This is... Th th <clears throat> nobody could believe that this... Uh, uh, lad had been the most sinful of sinful types and come from a really sin, you know, a, a really sinful background. Almost certainly, he'd been brought up in a very pristine fashion in the streets of Salt Lake City or whatever. Um, and I think this reminds us, you know, that we need to be realistic. We need to remember that we are sinners. Paul saying, um, "All have sinned and come short." of the glory of God. But some of us are a further distance away from God than others are. Some of us are not that far away, perhaps in our background and in our experience. But we are all at a distance from God. And this is the point that Paul is making here, that there is a separation between man and God. And that distance, however long it might be, needs to be Broach needs to be removed and we need to come near to God. And how do we do this? Well, Paul changes his illustration at this point from distance to barriers. And I'm going to come on to my second point now, which is demolition. There we are. Now, in, in going to many, many sermons over the years, I don't think I've ever come across a sermon point called demolition. But I think it's valid here. Um, and what we see in this next paragraph, yeah, um, for Christ himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Um, and he goes on to say, by abolishing uh, in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. But Paul is talking here about a barrier that Christ Jesus has demolished, has destroyed. Now, a number, a good number of years ago, I can remember seeing something on News Northwest or Granada North or whatever it might have been about two blocks of skyscraper flats somewhere in Liverpool. 
and they'd been built in the 1960s and were pretty dire and desperate by the beginning of, uh, um, of, of this century or even the 1990s, I can't remember exactly when it was. And so all the inhabitants had been moved out and then what did they do? They blew them up and on um, Northwest News we saw these uh, two skyscraper blocks, I can't remember whether they went at exactly the same time or about five seconds after the other, but this, there was some of this boom and the, the whole lot came down. It was all over in a moment. It was spectacular. And uh, there was a crowd watching. The crowd had been put, of course, very carefully. You had to make sure that uh, nothing ended up on top of them. But uh, there was quite a crowd watching as they saw this spectacular thing. And I think sometimes God does that within our lives, doesn't he? He transforms us suddenly and spectacularly. So that we move from this position of distance to um, a clear and definite relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But sometimes it doesn't happen like that. And I was talking to Justin in midweek because I can't remember what happened exactly with the flats on downhill, but they came down round about the same time that these flats in Liverpool that uh, came down in such a spectacular fashion. And Justin and I, Justin couldn't remember exactly, but we agreed that what had happened there is that they were brought down much slower I think if they'd been blown up, there might have been quite a bit of collateral damage that had uh, uh, come along as well. So they were brought down a bit slower, a bit more steadily. So there weren't any crowds that stood around watching because they'd soon have got bored to death if that had been the case. There might have been the odd one or two uh, who on occasion stood and watched a and, and saw a, you know, a, a little bit of something <laughs> happening there. But there wouldn't have been the crowd that there was for the explosion in Liverpool. And I think this reminds us that sometimes God moves in us bit by bit. He moves slowly to bring about this reconciliation uh, between us and himself. And it's less spectacular than uh, the explosion, the, the, the sudden awareness of God's presence. But sometimes it's much more slowly and it's less noticeable as we move along um, this distance and we become nearer to God, as we come to understand more and more about Him through His Word. So, the important thing is that Jesus demolishes the barrier that exists between us and God, sometimes in a spectacular fashion, sometimes more gradual, which is less noticed perhaps by the people round and about. But he does that job of demolition so that the barrier between us and God is removed and we are reconciled with God. And we're reconciled with others as well. So we see in this passage distance, we see demolition, God destroying the, um, the barriers that exist between us and him. Thirdly, and my final point this morning, we have development. Once the demolition has been done, once the reconciliation has been made between us and God, then we need to build on that. Um, sometimes people come to know Jesus Christ and never really proceed beyond that. Um, but that's not what God wants. And what we see in the third paragraph, if you have your Bibles with you, you would have noticed, which we don't always see, uh, we don't see at all, in fact, on the overhead, that the, this passage is split by the translators into three paragraphs, and my three points have corresponded with each of the paragraphs. But in the third paragraph, we find that um, 
we as fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Um, once the flats were destroyed in Liverpool, then before anything could be done, and the same on downhill, before anything could be done with um, the land on which these skyscrapers had stood, then there had to be foundations laid down. And once we uh, are reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, then we need to build, there need to be foundations built in our lives so that we can not just um, enjoy the experience of, uh, of knowing God through Christ Jesus, but that we can allow God to develop and build on our lives, to create these foundations on which um, we can be built into the people that God wants us to be, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what is the foundation within our lives? Is it God? Are our lives built and developed on a godly foundation? Or are there perhaps other foundations that sometimes come in? Family. Yes, family is important, but it shouldn't be the main foundation. Church. Sometimes we can become taken up with the business of church and forget um, the Lord himself, forget the, the, the purpose behind it all of worshipping God. Uh, it's easy to be taken up with the admin of church life, as I'm sure Barbara will be able to test that. <laughs> but we need to see beyond that and remember the, uh, um, that we're here because of Jesus Christ and because of our relations with God. What else can be friend, a, a foundation? Friendship. We're all social creatures and we like to mingle together. Some of us more than others, perhaps. Um, money. Some people can make money as a fa in, into a foundation for um, their lives. But here Paul is saying to us that the only real foundation, the main foundations on which our lives should be built is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so there we are then. Uh, the way to reconciliation, there's this distance between us and God, this barrier. We need to allow God to demolish that barrier. Uh, but he won't demolish it unless we give him uh, permission to do so. Um, the, the people who blew up the flats in Liverpool had to have permission from those who owned the flats before they went ahead with the demolition. And then we need God, we need to allow God to um, develop, uh, to bring about development once <coughs> the demolition has taken place and to have Christ Jesus as the cornerstone in our lives as we go forward from there. May the Lord add his blessing to his word to us today. And I'm going to ask the band that they'll come forward now with another song after which we'll have our time of intercessory prayer.